Good afternoon, everyone. Well, my name is Andre Krehel, and uh, I make most of my living by consulting in cybersecurity and digital forensics. Um, I want to show you a little bit different view on a web exploitation, the way we see it when we uh, go and investigate certain incidents that do happen. I would say 60% of the work that we do uh, relates to PCI DSS exploitation. So it really means someone exploiting web vulnerabilities on e-commerce platform and then basically extracting data from a databases which are primarily PCI DSS data. All right, so what do I really do for a living? Um, I tried to explain to my mom and I was explaining, explaining, and she was, she was not really getting it. So I told her, I'm a digital firefighter. So when people have a digital fire, I go, right? I, however, I do not have a luxury to retire in 20 years, right? I'm gonna continue being a digital firefighter. Um, don't have any unions to support me. Um, but she gets that concept, right? So when there is a problem, digital problem, and I go and try to see what the problem really is, A, investigate it, and B, then we do the remediation of the problem. Uh, so let me show you something that we created, um, and um, this was for the purposes of, of a training in Europe. Around a five, years, uh, five years ago, a certain entity in Europe came to us and asked us, could we train um, European law enforcement on uh, something related to digital forensics, and especially like a new era, like memory type analysis, network forensics. Um, and we did, we came up with a program uh, that's still going on. Uh, and as a part of that program, we did a web exploitation. So what we have here is a PCAP file. Um, and the PCAP file is from, uh, the web server in the DMZ, where uh, the inbound traffic is filtered, outbound is not. Um, classical scenario probably a few years ago then we need to confirm if incident really happened, what have happened, and um, we have a basically PCAP file available for uh, that event, and then can we trace any malware in it? What can we really tell about that PCAP file? All right, so all that we have, the piece of the evidence that we've got is this PCAP file, nothing else, right? We don't have logs, we don't have access to the server, sounds like a cloud, maybe. Um, so all that we have is our recorded data set basically from the communication back and forth. All right, so we come in here, and um, this is what we had. So what would be a good start, right? What would you do if you got a PCAP file, right? Uh, one of my friends, when I asked him that question, uh, over many, many years, after maybe like six or seven years, he said, you know what, we have so many incidents here that whenever we get new one, I just update my resume, right? <laughs> so, so one good one could be that, you know, just take the five minutes, update your resume, right, before you dive into it. Then get a glass of water, right, call your friend, ask him how he is doing, if he did any analysis similar to this, what's new out there, uh, was he researching any blocks. Um, so good, the main reason why I'm doing this in Wireshark, of course you could download some commercial tool. Uh, for example, Net, NetWitness has a tool called Net, uh, NetWitness Investigator. Probably a little bit better than this. The beauty of the Wireshark is that uh, when you work with the data, uh, with the data that's being transmitted, you need to decode them, right? So you need to kind of understand what's being transmitted. The Wireshark has many of these filters for free. It's a beauty, right? So good tool to use, good tool to use. Um, okay, so let's look at some statistics here. Um, and the first thing that is very apparent here is that when you look at the packets, how many packets were transmitted, it's very small, like 0 0.293 megabit per second, right? Have you seen such a card, NIC card, so it really means this is exported data set, right, it's really limited. This probably to solve takes five minutes, right, to solve. Shouldn't be any longer, right? Okay, um, when we get a file like this, where you do you really start? How can you hold any information in it? So let's look at some statistics. Statistic is good, right? Anyone study statistic? It's good, right? Doesn't have all the answers, but shows you something. So let's look at the protocol hierarchy here. The big surprise is Ethernet-based technology, right? So, uh, of course, if that was not Ethernet-based, maybe we wouldn't be able to disassemble in the first place here and decode it, right? So it's a good one, right? We got the first point. Wireshark can do the Ethernet-based technology. Um, now, we see that the Internet Protocol version 4 involves, then most of it are TCP sessions with a hyper-transfer protocol, right, HTTP. 
And then uh, we see some IP version 4. Anytime you see something, you try to kind of scale what's good, what's not good, which is on the first eye. Um, at the first view, you could say, is IPv6 important here? What really happens? Can there be any tunnel, anything transmitted? But as you, as you can see here, the volume is very low. You cannot tell from this speaker, but basically, if you dive into it, you would find out it's just basically default interface into it. Um, anything suspicious here when you're looking through it? They did tell us this is a web server from a DMZ zone. Um, and there is a trivial file transfer protocol with a data transfer. Yes? Is there a way to focus, please? A little bit better? It's a good word. It's good to focus on, right? On something. Lower? Yeah. Okay, I'll try it. Of course, what happens with a system based on Windows, uh, everything's gonna crash. <laughs> it's a feature, don't laugh. <laughs> what should I lower to? That was a suggestion. Zero? That's a good one, right? 800 by 600? Like this? Try it. How about this? Better now? All right. Good. Well, it's kind of messing up, messing up the whole wire shark here, though. It's going to be tough to do, to be honest with you. Let's try this. Yeah, I don't think it's just going to work. Okay, cool, maybe. All right. So let's look at the more statistic here. Um, it, let's look at the endpoints. Look at IPv4. Now, first thing that we need to answer is what, what IP address is the web server? Um, have you had these clients when you call them and you ask them, so what are you really running on your web server? Is it JBoss, is it Drupal, Mambo? And they said, you know what, I don't really know. I think all of those. <laughs> or uh, what, what, how is your web server? I mean, is it a Windows base? Is it a Linux, Linux based? I think they have all of those. <laughs> right? So you kind of have to always figure out know, things on your own, right? You can't really trust these people. Okay, uh, so um, you have to kind of first guess what is that web server. Um, and uh, there's an answer to it. So you think that through, what that would be. Of IPv6, you mentioned that, some TCP stream here, some UDP. So still, as, as you can see here, this is a really small file, but it's still a lot in here, right? You kind of can't get a hold of it. How am I going to hold of this, right? Um, but statistics, so far, statistics play something good for me. So let's look at the uh, conversation. And it may be sorted by uh, number of bytes. Okay. Would that tell you something? That probably would tell you something, right? Number of the packets going back and forth, uh, the answers, right? Any suggestions here for a web server? Anyone? What address? No one wants to tell, right? No one really wants to tell. Okay, um, so let's look at the TCP sessions. Um, and let's turn off name resolution. Let's sort it by the port. Anything interesting going on here? Something interesting is in it, right? Yeah, great. Kind of like a port scanning, but this was attacked against the web server, so it would be probably like a web vulnerability type of scan, right? Good, that's a good one, right? Of course, you would not see the ARP here, so you would not see the ARP and the resolution on the local subnet. And you see the port 80, right? So now, uh, which one is the web server? What IP address? 135, exactly. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so at least we learned something from a statistic, right? So I told you, statistic is useful, right? I wasn't lying. 
Uh, now it's a UDP here. Uh, there is something interesting. Uh, so let's turn on the back on the name resolution. Um, and I could probably just follow the stream here, and I'm not gonna do that. So what do you think really happens? Imagine if you are a hacker, right? Just for a second, right? Be a bad guy. <laughs> What would you really do, right? You kind of have to get something back from the machine, right, from the server. So how would you do that here, right? So where that would be. So maybe a good start would be look for anything that's basically going and originating from that web server, right? Maybe. Any, what we call the SIM packets going out from the web server. Would that be a good choice, potentially? Do we agree? Okay, so let's look at it. Maybe I have a filter here, uh, something like this. So now we have to learn the filters. And I've got two sessions here, basically. Um, so what I did is here is I had to filter everything that was thin, and, and I also had to add this filter. If I did not add this filter, look what would happen. I'm looking for a thin package, but I'm also getting acknowledgement. Right? So that's not what I really want. What I really want are only these sessions. Perfect. So now, what's next? Who can help me? I kind of have to get paid. I'm not sure if I told you. you know, I'm depending on this. It's a consulting job. So I really need to get paid. So what would we do next? Call my buddy, ask him. All right, so I guess the easiest way to do this would be maybe look at the stream, right? To follow the stream. You know, like a follow the crowd. Everyone goes somewhere, right? Go and take a look at the mentality. All right, so the first one, let's reconstruct the first one. Anything suspicious here? Answer is no. How do I know? Very simple. You go, you know the Google, you go to Google, Google the manual for Wireshark, and then Google for samples, and ask them what samples are available, and they show you all good samples of the traffic, and you will find out this is a browser announcement on SMB on the Windows subnet, okay? So okay, I scratched this one. So this one is not malicious. Confirmed by Google and Wireshark help. Right, go back. Right. Follow the stream. Anything interesting here? In the stream? Right? So who am I? Right? So imagine, so what are we really doing? Let's look at that stream. Is that stream HTTP based? No, it's not, right? not, um, although the exploitation probably happened over the HTTP. So someone became an authority on the system, the system directory, and then did some TFTP transfer uh, of the files called password. He tried first time, didn't really work. He tried second time, and he did transmit the file via TFTP. So now the, 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 the obvious question would be, what really happened? Why he would try the TFTP? Around five, six years ago, when we went to our clients and we asked them, so what do you really filter? On outbound, anything TCP, anything UDP. And on inside, oh, we don't really filter UDP, it's connectionless, right? But outbound just goes out there. And by the way, we use a Unix trace route, we wanna trace over six core hours, kinda of prohibits that. So not a good, it's not a good idea, right, to turn it off on a firewall. And TFTP client was directly embedded in a certain directory on the Windows machine by default. So hackers loved it, basically it was a way when they got in, right away they fire up, try to get out, if they can get anything on UDP, and it's fast, right? Compared to the IP, it's fast. All right, so we have something in here. Um, let's switch a little bit into the presentation. So, think about this. If you don't know datalossdb.org, there's a site that basically tracks how many incidents are out there. And a web and a hacking, is, if you look at in here, it's like a prevalent category. Um, the exploitation that usually that you can see uh, targets usually the web application or the user or browser, or it's a combo of everything. So if you are sitting in the right position, you probably are able to capture that information that you are looking for. Um, interesting study is, if you don't know Larry Poneman, take a look at his studies. And one of the studies he did is, how much is it gonna cost if you wanna bring someone like us? That's not my invoice. Although some clients told me already that there's really no big difference between me and the hackers because my invoice looks like an extortion letter from hackers. But um, in reality, you know, we, we try to help them. Someone else is trying to extort them. 
Uh, but the, these attacks are maybe don't go to the millions in terms of the investigation or remediation. This is what the number here is. It's not for the notification or for replacement of the credit card, okay? Um, so let's go back now into, uh, into our, uh, our example. So what would be the next? What do you think would be the next kind of like a logical step? Yes. And how do we do that? No, we don't have in the lock. Yeah, we've done it multiple times. We replayed it. That's a good idea. It takes a little bit longer, right? So there is a solution right in here. Offer. Yeah, that's a good idea, right? So let's now. So where we started? We really started looking at a web server, something going out. Right, so when someone exploits the server, then he's trying to establish some session going out. If it's a river shell, then you should be able to see that river shell. If there's something, you should see that something. Right, and we saw that. So we saw that part. And we saw TFTP being used. Right? Did you see the TFTP being used? So let's see if there is a way for us to uh, query. Where are all these requests? So these are all my GET requests, right? It's all just HTTP based, right? Anything interesting? I guess we need to look at the part info. All right, so let's, let's help with this a little bit different way. Uh, it has export objects, HTTP. You kind of have to learn the tool, too, a little bit. If you want to use it. Okay. And we go through it. And that, that probably wouldn't work, right? That wouldn't work, really. I'm going gonna, gonna to be a little bit more specific. So what would be more specific? What do you think? So let's try this. Let's go to the filters and find the one. Contains TFTP. What do you think? Something like this. Good choice? Do we think it's a good choice? Do we agree? Because of the resolution, it's going to be a little bit harder. But uh, look at here at the bottom. So the get reference is basically here. Right, the get. Anyone? Exactly. So what the beauty here is uh, when you get basically the, the plain HTTP request. Right, so what the attacker he, here did. He used the vulnerability also exploited by a known worm called NIMDA that basically double encodes certain character, which is what, slash. And he could walk out of the directory and walk into the director of the web server and then basically run the command of his choice. And the command of his choice was TFTP. He's trying to download the toolkit. Right? He would get the privilege of the web server itself, and then he would escalate it. The beauty of this hack is that it's basically all web-based. It has the same signature as a NIMDA. So if you're an admin and you're watching this and you're thinking like, oh, I just got infected, 
you might have a different problem. So the, what was mentioned here, just to go and replay it, yeah, it would work. It's almost like you go and you have a virus in the environment and someone tells you, well, we've got this Trojan, we removed it. Was anything exfiltrated? And the answer is, no, it's just virus, right? Nothing ever happens, right? You've got Trojan, nothing happens, right? And then someone's data, a certain hospital data, appear on the internet and you ask them how they appear on the internet. Well, it's just Trojan. We delete it. We cleaned it. Nothing really happened. All right, so now, now we have some idea here. Um, there, were, there were a few commands here, and if you follow them more precisely, you find out that attacker um, did them in a certain sequence. So now I would say I would replace the CFTP with something better. What that better would be? How about this? Better? All right. There we go. Anything interesting? First command. What he did, he just basically looked at the web server. Can he list the files? So let's see this. Follow the stream. Look at this. It's just a stream. That's the request right on the top, right? So he's just listing directory on the web server. Do you think he's the first one? No, he's not. Bad news for the admin. He's not the first one on the web server, right? Multiple viruses infected this computer. You better call the admin, tell him that. Right. Yeah, good that he was in there already, right? It's probably his friends already, they, they follow him, they're already on the server. Okay. Um, let's go back into it. So in the sequence, if you um, analyze the sequence, then you see the transfer here, so he transferred the file, and then he looks at the server again. Why do you think he did that? Verify it's uploaded, right? So when, if you reconstruct that stream, then you find out the file is there, right? So the file that he was transmitting is already in here, right? So let's go back to show that. Right, so he was transferred the file, who am I? And now we go in here, and who am I is in here, right? So he transfers the file into the server. And he does it for every time. Basically, he transfers the file, which is good, right? Then he transfers another file called Tono, right? And then he runs this at the end. C good minus L P, and he, he sparses it through the command line. Isn't that really powerful? Imagine this. He's doing everything through the web protocol. Through the web protocol, he's able to walk out the directory, call the local commands, and execute it, right? How long do you think this would take to hack? 15, 20 seconds? Probably all scripted it from the beginning and then holding the shell in his hand, most likely. Yeah, there is something going with the port 777 here. Uh, the question is, is it really a backdoor here on a port 777, right? What is it? Tiny. Uh, there should be a tiny tunnel, right? Yeah, there should be something. There should be something in here. Um, so what, what, do you think, what, is, what do you think is happening in here? So Okay, so what really happened in that conversation? Look at the logic. So when we get the file, we really go backwards, right? Because I was looking at the session that was originating from the web server, um, but it's really backwards when I'm looking at it right now. So the information goes, I uh, went from the backwards going upwards. So what really happened? Yeah, there was a netcat. Why would he do that? Why would he open up a netcat? Uh, 
Uh, not necessarily the reverse shell. What really happened here is when he got into the server, he got the privilege with the credentials of the web server. Is that sufficient for him to walk to any directory he wants to? No. So he needs to, he needs to escalate it, right? He needs to escalate the privilege. So he does a trick. He downloads another exploit the, in the sequence in the order that you saw. There was an exploit that was called good, right? Something that was really good. Um, and um, ask him, who do you want to be today? Right? And then he runs uh, a command that you saw, the who am I, and he is anti-system authority. And he goes into C, C, D, V, and T2 directory, right? System32, what do you think follow next? This was actually terminal server. What do you think is going to follow? At the bottom, go to CD repair directory, copy the same into the password. Remember you saw that password to begin with, the transfer? All right, you just copied the same, got the same. Now what's happening on your network? Like a Swiss cheese. Terminal server, he's signing after this, He's not putting any backdoor. He's signing directly with user's credentials, right? Into the, all applications that you share, your Citrix, whatever you share, he owns it. And most of the companies, now we see more of a segregation. So what principle really he breached? There's no really separation between inside and outside credentials for authentication. Everything is tied into the AD. He gets the whole of the database from a terminal server. It's pretty much good to go. Right? If you separate those credentials, then he wouldn't be able to walk in. So the beauty for him here was that he did not have to put any, any backdoor. He just basically right, went into it, spread it through the network, and then he could plan the backdoors wherever he wanted to. But he was already your user. He was already your admin. And um, of course, you did not have to send him a check for maintaining your network properly. Right? <laughs> OK, let's look at, there was another port here that was interesting, and it was port 2000, remember? Right. Remember this? How did you get, how did we get that? Through the HTTP, remember? We were assembling the stream. So basically we're just looking at the source or destination port, right? So the pattern of the traffic appears through the HTTP as well from the port where the destination actually was and the traffic was originating into. Isn't that interesting, right? So you always have to think a little bit different. Um, we had an admin and he said, well, it was a UDP-based type of worm that hit us. When you have a UDP-based worm doing a buffer overflow on your system, is the outbound connections gonna be UDP? Doesn't have to be. Doesn't, in reality, it doesn't have to be. Here's the HTTP and then a different session is going out. So that's what you most, most likely need to look for. You need to look for different protocols that, are, that were used as a part of exploitation on a network. Because he's gonna use what's available to target a server, but then he has his own toolkit, his, his own CNC channels, his own protocol, his own strategy, how he's gonna get out. And he will try all of those, basically, like a UDP-based, TFTP, try the Netcat. And if he can't get out, he will get out. All right. One piece that we did not do here is the TFTP. So we should probably go and take a look at the TFTP stream. Now, I mean, most of you play with the Wireshark. So really beauty here is that it parses out based on the OSI model, which I'm gonna get into it. Um, and then that's, the, that's also the separation of the protocol itself. So decodes the protocol and shows you the content. So for example, in here, it shows you the file itself. It shows you the acknowledgement, it shows you the block, it shows you the packet that you are on. So we, here we have TFTP, and I wanna list all the, uh, what's the type? I would like to see all the transfers. So as you can see, I, you need to know a little bit of these filters, right? You have, kind of have to know work with the tool. But these are all the transfers that did happen. Good, tunnel, and here's the password. So a few of them were requests, and they basically 
um, read request and one was a write. So these requests, how he originated these requests? Not through TFTP, but I see them here because they were captured as a part of the conversation. So they were originated as an HTTP request to a web server, initiating the command line and transferring the file via TFTP. So the web server TFTP client asked for the file that was sitting somewhere and pulled that file to the web server. Again, a little bit different, right? So you have a TCP-based protocol. I'm asking for a UDP-based basic application, getting the files into the web server. Um, okay, so uh, what about this? Follow UDP stream. What do you think about the follow UDP stream? How many of you believe in UDP stream? How many? I told you UDP doesn't have any stream. Huh? It does, but Wireshark is telling me it does, right? It's an application I use. I mean, these guys, they really know what they're doing. No? They're just kind of laughing at this project. All right, so I follow this UDP stream. That's this. Where is my file? Where is my file? Someone stole it? Before I got it. Where is it? So now, when you work in this era, you need to understand the protocols. So you have to go where? Google, RFC, read the manual, read the protocol, and understand how that pro protocol really operates. And you will realize that there is a request for a data, and then the data are coming in a block as the afterward session. So also, when you are loading the site, uh, you think everything comes as a one HTTP GET request to your computer? It comes, it's parsed into certain sessions, right? Into certain streams of that website as a certain content. It doesn't come like, oh, I do the GET and a whole CNN appears on my computer. It doesn't work like that. There are these streams that basically, almost if you frame the site, the content is being delivered. Some packets are fragmented, some are not. That depends on the size. Same here. If you read the specification for the protocol, you would quickly figure that this is only the request. So the block of the data follows right beneath that. So let's look at in here. And I could just do that very quickly. Look at the number here, 5092. And he, as you can hear, see here, here is my read request, and here's my first block of the data. You see it? Right. So that's my first packet. All right, so let's follow this. Better? Better, right? What's the MZ program cannot be run in the MS build mode? This looks like a program. It's a real program, who am I? So basically it's a file. Of course, I would have to clean it, so I would just pick the conversation. Now I would save it as a raw file. And then what, random my computer? <laughs> no, you guys don't do that? You don't just ran, random files you find on the internet on your computer? See what happens? Have backup ready, no? You call your friend, ask him. I'm, I'll send you a fine for analysis. Just open up, tell me what you see on your screen. <laughs> no, literally, that's what I do. I have a friend like that. But he's, he is the binary reverse engineering expert. So I send him the file, he looks at it and tells me what he sees on his screen in his sandbox. Right? That's a good friend to have. <laughs> he doesn't mind. He always sends me first some legal disclaimer how much he wants for the work. All right, so this is the file. So that's how we would save the file from it. Um, so now, if you, if you think the uh, web ex exploitations, um, later as you can tell, we basically could solve the file without having access to the logs, uh, without basically doing heavy forensic on a web server, and everything was basically in the PCAP file. The 
beauty of today's era is that it's all thanks to interactions. If there's no interaction with the system, a data would not be recorded. It would not have the pickup part. Right? 100% security. Don't do any business. Cut the wire. No one's going to talk to you. There's not going to be any pickups. They, I'm, I guarantee you, most likely, are very secure. Right? So, but thanks to interactions, you're able to, to get the uh, underlying layer and basically record the data and then do the analysis. So this kind of shows the uh, powerful side of the network forensic. Now, usually what happens, for example, like in a corporate espionage cases, at some point, this communication switches to something different, like a crypto channel, like a CNC type of channel. Um, if you didn't start it early, you probably didn't capture the component that creates the crypto on that system. But if you start it early with the capture of the data, you also get the crypto library or something that these guys install on the system. And then you have the same advantage as they do because you can go and decrypt the data if you know how to get it from that crypto library. So uh, it, it is a powerful tool um, to do that to um, basically analyze the uh, web data. And it also gives you a different view on uh, the traffic. Now, I have something in here very similar. Anyone? Yes, how did you know? Yeah, that's a good one. I thought you knew by 007300. <laughs> no? Okay, so this is a cat obfuscate data. How many of you have seen this? few, right? Very famous hack, actually, right? Um, maybe a few years ago. What was uh, special about this? Firewalls. Application firewalls. At that time, application firewalls did not have decoding of the CAS encoded data. There's one thing that you missed. I think it was one or two vendors. I don't remember exactly which one that actually did encode it. So imagine SQL injection, one equal one apostrophe, would fly through a firewall as the CAS encoded. Scary? Scary. And that's what usually hackers look for. It's uh, like this hack. It's nothing really dramatic. If it's an opportunistic attack, it's nothing really dramatic. They basically look for the weakness in a system and then exploit that weakness. It's one thing that someone forgot, right? Someone forgot something on, on the server. Uh, this is a beef exploitation, for example, of the victim. Uh, and um, the open source tools, we create our own box to do this. Uh, we were looking at the various products, but they are quite expensive. So then we decided that we're going to go and compile our own uh, VM machine uh, with some of the tools. I'll, I just want to show you some of them here that um, we basically use um, in our arsenal. TCP extract is one of the tools that can go and kind of carve the data out of the PK file. So you tell the tool the parameters, and it goes and grabs it. So for, you, for example, when you saw here the executable, TCP extract would go to the data and pull all the executable right from the file or all the documents that are being transmitted from the file. The chaos reader be reprogrammed a few times to do different things. Uh, it's a really neat two-page Perl script that does decoding of the data. And especially when you're dealing with the CNC channels, then you will have to write something custom. So you will have to write something custom to decode that screen. You will not be able to do that. Like what I was, what I was doing in here uh, was quite trivial because every protocol that I was touching on, Wireshark actually knew in the arsenal. So it could decode that protocol. But imagine someone writes a custom channel over HTTP. Then you don't have a decoder for it. Right? So you have to write your own decoder, kind of like go and, and, and understand, reverse engineer that protocol and the sessions in that protocol as much as you can. Of, of course, most of these sessions do go encrypted at some point. As I said, at the beginning, the hack might not be encrypted, but then they go encrypted. So it's going to be harder. So you have to look very carefully at the parts that is not encrypted and figure out as much as you can about the malware. Some of the malware is as simple as one library on a computer and then only downloads the tool to the memory of the computer. And then what happens in the memory? How many of you can maybe image, create a snapshot memory like in 10 seconds? We still want to search for those people. There is, there is a job for them, I guarantee you. Memory is big. It's multiple gigs at these days. On servers, it's really big. So you can't really do, uh, even a dump of a process, it's really hard to do because you need to know which process you need to dump. The program does and exits the memory. 
of course, there are techniques to carve the memory, kind of like to carve for its own space, but a little bit harder to do. Uh, another good program that you might want to look at it is definitely Wireshark that I presented in here. As you can see, it's quite a powerful tool. There's also T Shark, a version, text version of it. SSL Dump is an interesting project because it, it will provide certain understanding into the layer of encryption. So SSL itself has a structure. Of course, if you don't have a certificate, you can decrypt it, but you can make the data representation of what's encrypted and um, you know, what the sources, destinations are in the conversation, uh, how much data was transmitted probably through the channel. And um, this applies, I usually get a question, what about wireless? As long as it's Ethernet-based technology, it will work. There's no real difference in the wireless, okay? Uh, I wrote a nice article on this on Forensic Focus. You might want to go and look it up. Um, which basically has all these tools and how we put this box together a, a, few, uh, a few years ago. Um, of course, you need to know how to record it. Uh, there's a little bit of the magic to this, how to record the data. And there are commercial tools that you can probably use. Um, important piece is, this is something you're going to be living with. These are the frames in your head. These are the frames of the protocol. Like, what is it? IPv version 4 protocol. Okay, fourth, first uh, four bytes, what's in them? Next four bytes, what's in them? What that value actually is? And then you're looking at the data, and every day when you're doing this, it becomes uh, really automatic. What options are enabled? Um, OSI model. Uh, this is a tool called Explico. You might want to look into that as well. If you use, for example, Chaos Reader on this with a hexadump, you would probably get the answer almost right away. Like in three or four minutes, you would be able to, from the HTML report, go and say most likely what happened in here. The same with Explico. If you ran it through it, most likely you would get it. Okay. This is a Chaos Reader. This is getting pose requests. And of course, some tips for the businesses here. Um, so let's go back into um, the, uh, the Wireshark. Um, and let's look at the uh, request. So now basically what we can tell the, the other person is, yes, it was a good thing that you updated your resume. You actually been hacked, it wasn't a virus. Uh, although your IDS is reported as a virus, uh, someone hold a hand on the keyboard while they were doing this. Uh, the really what happened was they exploited known problem, double decode, and then transferred a few files back and forth. Uh, they did leverage the privilege on the server, they escalated privilege on the web server, and they dump your SAM file, which most likely they cracked because your passwords are weak, and they are now all around your network. And probably the only thing you have are these few IP addresses from these 3,000 proxy hosts that you need to start chasing on your environment. So that would be pretty much a good story to tell. Thank you very much. Anyone has any questions? Yes. No, you can't. Usually you need to use, either you have a box that does it for you, right, or you have a commercial tool that already does it. So some organizations, um, especially government and law enforcement, they do have um, devices that do capture the PCAP files already. So, all the time, all the time. It's more of a trigger when there is something malicious, but they scan for certain patterns, and when they see the pattern, they record the pattern. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's true, but most likely, most of the people are going to give you a PCAP format. Um, that's the reality. I guess it's, it's the format of the choice for those individuals. So it's not really your choice. It's the choice of someone giving you that file, and they will export it in a, in a PCAP format for you. They will, ha they will hash it. They will send it to you. Oh, there, it's a problem with the recording in the first place, because you can lose 
You can lose the data on the NIC card. You can lose data by the kernel. And you can lose data by misconfiguration of that recording device. So there, there are more errors. I would say there are more errors on the way that that device is implemented as it is with the format itself. And if you don't have documented, like most of the data that we get, no one really documents the losses for those devices. So you get the file, but no one really tells you what got lost in the translation. And here in a reconstruction, if you miss one packet, you might not be able to re-inject the packet between the stream, right? So it really means you follow something, it's not gonna reconstruct. Right? Any more questions? Yes, sir. I updated my resume, that was my first thing. Yeah. <laughs> in Wireshark, okay. Uh, I started looking for the outbound traffic from the web server. So I, so I tried to profile what the IP address of the web server is, and then I looked for anything that would be initiated from that web server. Uh, if it's a web server, there should not be much initiated from that web server, other than maybe regular patches from the web server, but there is, shouldn't be really literally any traffic originated from it. So instance would be like a river shell, right, being ran, any buffer overflow being ran. Yeah, sure. So the reality is these guys, when they get in, they wipe it, the lock. Uh, and since lock is in a space where it's constantly overwritten, most likely it's not gonna be recoverable. So in reality, you're not gonna get any locks. We just had a machine here in a, in a city. It was a Unix-based machine, and it wasn't even like a secure wipe. Uh, once they realized that the processor is spinning on that machine quite fast, which they see, just run the top command, and they see that the machine is processing quite a bit, they just wipe, they not even wipe it, they just delete the lock and just let it go. They, they don't even bother, like you see the tool being compiled, it's like a case like a month old, that you just see the tool compiled right in the line, stick into the folder, not even deleting the tool, delete the locks, as you see the commands initiated to delete the locks from a line here to line here, that's it. And you don't have locks, then try to do any recovery, it's not there, it's overwritten. So you can't really, reality is you can't really rely on locks. You can't rely on locks if someone is transferring them to a different machine. If there's a collector, if there's a collector that pulls it in a timely manner. But as you saw here, this takes maybe 15 seconds, 20 seconds. Plus maybe five seconds of wiping. So you have a 20 seconds window. So it almost has to be kind of real time system, which if you have a larger network, most likely is not the case. They were wiped out? Were you able to track that SQL injection like from beginning to end? Not well, Not well though. Yeah, it's, I tell you, yeah, it, it really helps. What helped me is the, that I've been doing the pen testing as well as cyber and forensics. I see a really big benefit to it. Uh, because most individuals that I work with, even in the cyber area and digital forensics, they don't know much about the pen testing. And if you don't have the good feel about the applications, right, the web applications, then it's very hard for you to judge what's real, what's not real. What is the met? Any more questions? Okay, so what I did was um, in here. If you filter for that IP address and you do only um, Thin. Then you also get acknowledgement. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to trans uh, to a filter that I would only see let me, let me, let me show it here. And you will get it. Okay. 
I can. Right? So here is what happens. On the right side. So what really happens in a handshake? You get thin, thin egg. So you wouldn't really filter. So you would see all the acknowledgments. So if I want to filter the acknowledgments, then I suppress the flag. There's also, are you familiar with the masking like in the TCP dump, the parentheses and hexa code, basically because it's eight bit, where the flag is being set, it's basically one bit. So you could use the masking, but it doesn't work on some version of the Wireshark. So it can be done more, a little more fancy. Five minutes? Okay. Uh, any more questions? Yeah, sure. I don't want to say I'm that good, but I usually get into five minutes into it. And it's just this, the, what most people miss is that you have to have some system, right? So statistics is very good. So there's like a TCP um, D stat program that runs a statistic on a file. And it's a really great tool, right? So statistic is really good. Then profiling geolocations is very good too. So Wireshark has a plugin for geolocations. And all these things, when you are doing this type of work, you look at the statistical analysis, geolocations, uh, data, like where, where you really uh, came from. You see something from uh, Asia on American-based system that they never do uh, business in Asia, you have the IP address, right? and then you basically test all those hypo hypotheses, and then you look for a data being originated from those servers that been compromised. So there has to be, if someone is getting something, they need to get something from the server. Reality, they came into the network to get something from the server. And um, of course, it doesn't have to be that server. So in a SQL injection, what really happens, you have a web server that's processing, and you have maybe a SQL server behind it. But they go through that web server to get into the store procedure on that SQL server. And they zip the data, they shift the data, it's going out. As I, and as, as I showed you in here, you are not looking for the same session. So the session that made a request is just the request to do something. And then you follow that session, that protocol, to somewhere else. So you have to jump to, to, to that. And um, in most cases, I would say like 95% of the cases, it does work. Where it really doesn't work is a corporate espionage. Uh, because that malware is really custom, and it's almost like a DLL file loaded on the secretary computer goes to a personal Yahoo page, or page of some individual. How is that malicious? Not really. And then you have to be really creative if this secretary actually knows this Yahoo individual and uh, is in a contact, you're asking all kinds of personal questions, has to get both permission, sign 10 agreements related to sexual harassment. Right? Yeah, you're welcome. Any more questions? Great, thank you. <laughs>